Hey everybody, welcome back to D&J's Epic Quest. This is a epic side quest on the Redwall series. My kind of review, short summary, and my ranking of each of the books. Now that I have finished all 22 of them, I think it has taken me a little over two years uh, to read them all. But again, this was just kind of like my fun read, my spare time read, while we recorded Malazan and uh, Curse of the Fallen. So yeah, it should be it should be interesting. These summaries are not my own. I grabbed them from the internet, so they very well could be right or wrong. Uh, but it's just to mainly give me kind of a reminder of of each of the the books. So. First, I've also read uh, some of these, not all of them. So we'll see. This will be fun for me to see what I remember of things and and <laughs> not. And, you know, again, ranking. It'll be interesting to see how I would rank things against, you know, how you rank them. For sure. To start it off, we have a what I would consider like S tier, my favorites. And then we have uh, A tier, which is like fantastic. B tier, which is great, but not quite like fantastic or like a favorite. C tier is kind of like, you know, average. Just it was it was a good story, but there could have been more. D tier was kind of like what I felt was bad. And then F tier, which I just thought was absolutely terrible. Um, thankfully in, in, I kind of like preliminarily did this and a lot, a good vast majority of the books, uh, are C and above. So that's definitely a good thing. So starting off, uh, with Redwall, I'm just going to go in chronological order or publication order, whatever you want to call it, publication order. So Redwall book one. Redwall by Brian Jakes opens with a joyous celebration of Abbot Mortimer's Jubilee. Creatures from the surrounding woods attend. The clumsy young novice Matthias is accompanying guests home when a wagon full of savage-looking rats careens by. Led by Clooney the Scourge, this horde takes over the abandoned St. Ninian's Church down the road and makes plans to take over Redwall Abbey. Threatened woodland creatures who accept sanctuary all offer their distinctive services to the common defense. Matthias shows promise as a military leader, much like the legendary Martin the Warrior, whose picture the rats steal from the abbey. Well, it's more of a tapestry than it is a picture. The bare spot on the wall where it had hung reveals clues to the whereabouts of Martin's sword, shield, and armor. Advised by elderly brother Methuselah, Matthias begins a quest for the legendary weapon. Clooney, meanwhile, tries a variety of approaches to conquer the abbey by force, but one by one these are turned back. Matthias is briefly held prisoner under the roof eaves by ferocious sparrows who nest there, led by Queen or by King Bull Spara. There, Matthias picks additional picks up additional clues about the sword. Escaping death, Matthias sneaks out of the abbey to follow the sword and thus misses most of the siege. He is befriended by a troop of quarrelsome shrews and advised by a cat and owl at an abandoned farm not to dare enter the sandstone quarry where Asmodeus, a dreaded giant adder, has hidden the sword. 
With Martin's inspiration, Matthias finds the trophy, beheads the snake, and races back to the abbey, hoping that he is not too late. Backed by a huge relief army of sparrows and shrews, Matthias arrives after Clooney has, by trickery, gotten inside and is at the point of executing the inhabitants. In the midst of a great battle, Matthias and Clooney fight to the death. Clooney is the stronger and is close to overpowering Matthias, but Matthias leaps away and cuts the rope holding up the Abbey's great Joseph Bell. It crushes, crushes the evil rat leader. Abbot Mortimer, however, has been mortally wounded. His dying order is that Matthias come, become the Abbey's permanent champion and marry Cornflower, with whom he is in love. A year after the so-called Late Rose Summer Wars, the Abbey holds another celebration of the restoration of peace and prosperity. I would rank Redwall as C. It was good, but there definitely could be a lot more. While it's funny, though, that Redwall happens to be what I remember the most, but I think it's just because I think over the my lifetime i've read it maybe two and a half times so i just kind of remember it a lot more i don't remember much from it you know like you say the norm name cornflower i remember that um i don't i don't really remember a lot of the names or really a lot of the plot points but the only thing i remember and i can't even remember if it was in Redwall or if it's one in one of the later books but i remember that matthias's name is like in what is it, an anagram or whatever, where you rearrange the letters? Yeah, is it, I am his. I thought it was I am that is. Or I am that is, yeah. Is it right. in Redwall or yeah. is that in a later one? Yeah, it is. That is Redwall. Okay, yeah. good. That's the, like, yeah, I, that's all I can really remember from it. <laughs> yeah, it was it was clever. I mean, I, I liked, I remember liking the search for his sword and shield. And, you know, I thought that they were, like, cleverly hidden, so to speak. Yeah, I remember a lot, but I just, like, compared to a lot of the other books, it's very, it's very average. I would, so I don't know if that's just a testament of him, it being his first book in the series, but, yeah. I, if it were me, I would maybe rank it higher just because it is, like, that first one. Um, even though I don't think it was the first one that I read. I mean, it's. it's yeah, I think you're telling me Salamandastron. All right. Well, we'll move on to Mossflower, which is the prequel to Redwall. Mossflower, a story of Redwall, uh, is a prequel to Brian Jake's bestseller Redwall. In this novel, Bella of Brockhall tells a young mouse the story of how Martin the Warrior saved Mossflower from the tyrannical rule of Sarmina, Queen of a Thousand Eyes. Martin comes to Mossflower as the late, as the last of the woodland creatures are fleeing the rule of Sarmina's father, Verdauga, only to have Sarmina rise to the throne after Verdauga's death. The woodland creatures want to fight Sarmina's rule, but they are not strong enough in number to defeat her army. However, Martin travels to Salamandastron to find Bor the Fighter and ask him to return to Mossflower and defeat Sarmina. A great battle ensues upon Martin's return, freeing all of Mossflower. Mossflower is a riveting prequel that will satisfy many questions for fans of Redwall. Martin the Warrior arrives in Mossflower just as the last family is fleeing the area in search of sanctuary among the woodland creatures. Martin is quickly arrested by Verdaga's army for carrying a weapon inside their territory. Martin is taken to the king where he is sentenced to the Kotir prison cells. The same night, Verdaga dies after being fed a poison arranged at the hand of his daughter, Sarmina. Sarmina blames the death on her brother, Gingivir, and has him imprisoned as well. Both Martin and Gingivir spend the winter in Kotir's prison. During the spring, a thieving mouse is caught in the forest with food stolen from Kotir, the mouse, Gonf, is quickly arrested and placed in a cell with Martin. Gonf and Martin are both freed with help from the woodland creature's resistance. So Gonf and Martin are both freed with the help from the woodland creature resistance, the Corum. Soon after, Martin becomes a part of the resistance, helping the woodland creatures figure out a way to fight Sarmina's rule and free Mossflower. 
To this end, Martin le- learns about the rightful ruler of Moss Flower, Bor the Fighter. Martin agrees to make a quest to Salamandastron and bring Bor the Fighter back to help Sarmina. As Martin, Goth, and a young mole named Dinny leave for their quest, the Quorum learn about the arrest and imprisonment of two young hedgehogs. The Quorum develop a plan to feed the poor captives while they work out a way to rescue them. A battle ensues between the woodland creatures and Sarmina's troops, but the woodland creatures manage to escape, mostly unharmed. A short time later, they enlist the help of an otter who has a knack for disguising himself as many different types of animals. This otter manages to get inside Kotir disguised as a fox. Sarmina believes his cover story and immediately makes him captain of her guard. The otter manages to get both the young hedgehogs and Gingivir out of Kotir, but his secret is discovered as they flee, and Sarmina manages to get an arrow into him as he leaves. The otter dies, bring about, and bringing about the wrath of his friends and family, the woodland creatures become more determined than ever to defeat Sarmina. To this end, they draft a plan to flood the natural lake that once existed under Kotir. However, as they work on this plan, a fox and his band of mercenaries join Sarmina and her army. This fox is a brilliant strategist who arranges an attack on the woodland creatures as they work on their plan, killing several of them. In revenge, the woodland creatures attack Kotir at dawn, killing many of their men and destroying their doors and shutters. Sarmina no longer trusts the fox, and so she arranges for him to die. Later, Sarmina threatens the remaining mercenaries against fleeing. The woodland creatures begin to flood Kotir, but the plan does not work due to low water levels. The woodland creatures decide they must flee Mossflower. However, at that moment, Martin returns with an army and a plan. Martin and his army lead an attack on Kotir, and at the same time, dam the river to flood Kotir. Martin faces Sarmina one-on-one in, one on one and kills her. However, Mossflower is then free to build the great abbey known as Redwall. So, as far as Mossflower goes, I thought it was absolutely fantastic. I'm going to put that in A tier. It was great to kind of get a lot of the backstory that you didn't really know that you were missing in Redwall. Um, so, it, yeah, it was just really cool to see how that unfolded. Gingivir, the Sarmina's brother, is actually the cat in Redwall that tells Matthias where to find the sword or where to find the quarry that Asmodeus was hiding in. So that was kind of cool how they all related there. I don't think I have disagreements about your placements. Um, and yeah, I don't really, I probably wouldn't have even remembered that that was a prequel. Yeah. It's been a long time since I've read any of these, but I'm getting that itch. now. <laughs> yeah, dude, you totally should. Totally should. All right. Well, we'll move on to the next one, which is Matameo. Matameo is set in the world of Redwall Abbey, a peaceful sanctuary inhabited by mice and other woodland creatures. The story begins with Matameo, the young son of the Abbey's hero Matthias, eagerly preparing for a grand feast celebrating the arrival of spring. Life in the Abbey seems idyllic until the ominous threat of Slagar the Cruel looms over them. Slagard, a wicked fox with a vendetta against Redwall, orchestrates a cunning plan to kidnap the young creatures of the Abbey. During a feast, Slagar and his band of marauding vermin launch a surprise attack. Matameo, along with several other young animals, including his friends, a hedgehog named Tess, and a squirrel named Brome, is captured and taken away. The captives are forced into slavery and are marched to a distant dark fortress known as Mar no no that's not it uh, known as Malcaris, where they are put to work under harsh conditions. Back at Redwall Abbey, Matthias, now a respected warrior and father, is devastated by the loss of his son. He rallies a crew- group of brave Redwallers, including Basil Stag Hare, to rescue the kidnapped youngsters. They set out on a perilous journey across dangerous landscapes, facing numerous trials such as fierce weather, treacherous terrain, and Slagar's cunning traps. 
As Matameo and his fellow captives struggle to adapt to their harsh new life, Matameo's leadership qualities start to shine. He inspires his fellow prisoners with hope and determination. He organizes a rebellion within the fortress, planning a daring escape. Meanwhile, the Redwall Rescue Party faces its own set of challenges. They are joined by an unexpected ally, a mysterious and formidable warrior named uh, Sunflash the Mace. The final confrontation occurs when Matameo and the Redwall Rescue Team finally reach uh, Malkaris. There's a fierce battle between the force of good and evil. Matameo, demonstrating bravery and resourcefulness, plays a crucial role in the fight against Sligar. Eventually, the Red Wallers triumph, freeing the captives and defeating Sligar, who meets his end in the chaos of battle. With the villains vanquished and the Red Wallers and, and the rescued animals return home, Matameo is celebrated as a hero, having grown from a young, an experienced mouse into a brave and capable leader. The story ends with the Abbey rejoicing in the return of their loved ones and the restoration of peace, illustrating themes of courage, loyalty, and the enduring spirit of community. So Matameo, I remember when I read it when I was in yeah middle school, I think I got all the way up to the 12th book, Legend of Luke. Matameo back then was my favorite and Matameo, again, is one of my favorites. I absolutely loved Matameo. Silgar is a uh, very crafty villain. He's actually a villain or a side character from Redwall. So Mathia, or Matameo is kind of the sequel to Redwall, whereas Moth's Flower is kind of the prequel. So it was really cool to kind of see all of that come to fruition. I remembered the the kidnapping and yeah, kind of the I don't know what you want to call it, like the slave drive, like when they're going from one place to you know the other one. That was about as much as I remembered. I didn't remember uh, the hair showing up in this book, but I I know the hairs were like some of my favorites. They know, they annoy me <laughs> very much. So <laughs> way to self censor yourself. Yeah, there. I was. Yeah, I know, I know, I know. I had to remember. Um, yeah, no, I, I had a hard time with the hairs throughout this whole series. They are just annoying to me. Hmm. Um, but I get it. Maybe I would feel differently you know? now reading them, but I remember as a younger kid, I they were like my favorites. That and the otters. Fair enough. I guess, I guess mostly like, well, yeah. Yeah, I the know. otters. I, mean, I, kinda, cool. I guess I like them all. Yeah. So, Matameo, uh, my first favorite in the series, uh, absolutely loved it. Um, the favorites would probably be the ones that I would reread again. So, all right. I'm not exactly sure how to pronounce her name. I don't know if it's Marielle or is it Mariel, but Marielle. I always, I always thought it was Mariel. Book. Yeah. Uh, in Volume 4 of the Redwall Abbey Saga, peace is threatened when Marielle, a fierce young mouse maid who's lost her name but kept her hatred for Gabool, the pirate rat king, arrives warm, worn and half-starved after recovering her memory under the kind care of the Abbey. Abbey animals, Marielle sets forth to, battle, to settle accounts with Gabool, accompanied by Dandin, Descend descendant of Martin the Warrior Mouse, Tarquin L. Wood Sorrel of the Long Patrol of Intrepid Hares and Dury Quill, an adventurous young hedgehog, led by an old poem uncovered by Dandon, menaced by needle beaked herons, masked weasels, and loathsome toads, and helped by unexpected allies, they make their way to Gabool's stronghold, where his vicious band is in disarray, and Gabool himself has been driven mad by the booming of the bell he stole from Ariel and her bellsmith father, en route to Lord Ronblade, Widestripe Badger Hero. After hair-raising adventures, Mariel, with friends, father, and a band of escaped slaves, and of course Ronblade, defeats Gabool and recovers the bell. So, Mariel, I thought it was fantastic. I would definitely put it in A tier. I was almost kind of debating as to whether I thought it was like a favorite, but 
I, yeah, I just, for whatever reason, I just felt that it just wasn't quite what I wanted. I loved it. I thought it was fantastic, but it just, it wasn't, it was, it was a close favorite. Very close. I've got, uh, I've just, I've got the book covers pulled up on my phone. I just Googled them so I could look at them a little bit more clearly than what you've got on the screen. And, um, yeah, isn't there, maybe you said it, I don't remember. Dad it was Joseph the Bellmaker, right? Yep, yep. Okay, I, I remember that, or if you just said it, then that might also be why. And then I remember, yeah, she has a, got a rope with like a big knot on it for a weapon, which I think you can kind of see in the picture. Right, yeah, her gull whacker. Gull whacker. Is what she calls there it. There you go, yeah. Her gull whacker. And that's actually like become her last name is Marielle Gull whacker. Pretty cool. But yeah, I guess. Do you have any other thoughts on the four so far? No, I don't. Nope. All right, eighteen more to go. So Salamandastron. This is probably the one that you remember or that you first started with. Um, I th- I think the first one I read was Outcast of Redwall. I think. Oh, really? I okay. think so. I'm not it's positive. Kind of like almost halfway in there. Yeah. Maybe, maybe it'll come back then. And correction in Matameo, it wasn't Sunflower or Sun Flash, the Mace. It was Orlando the Axe that they were joined up with. See, it's been so long already. <laughs> the story begins with the re- with the restlessness of Mara, the young ward of the Badger Lord of Salamandastron, Earth Stripe. She chafes under the discipline of the mountain mountain fortress and wanders off with Pickle, a rogue hare with a huge appetite. They meet up with a couple of weasels who seem friendly enough that Mara invites them to dinner. Hospitality prevails, but Earthstripe is suspicious and forces them to leave with the morning. He is right to do so because they are spying out the fortress for Farago, the assassin, an evil weasel who heads up a large band known as the Corpse Makers. One of them is Klitsch, Farago's son, second in command, itching to take over. Mara resents Earthstripe's coldness to her new friends and decides to run away. She is joined by Pickle. They meet up with their weasel friends, right, like... Glitch, who take them to Farago where they are held captive and ke- questioned about the treasure inside of Salamandastron. They know nothing about this, though. Farago sets his sights on conquest, eventually besieging, attacking, and through a secret agent, poisoning the food and water in the mountain. Meanwhile, two stoats from Farago's group, unhappy with their lot, go wandering in the forest and find their way to Redwall. The Abbey, hospitable to all, welcomes them, and they join a feast. That night, a storm descends, and a lightning strike loses the sword of Martin the Warrior that had been affixed to the weather vane, nearly killing Samkin the Squirrel, who has been having dreams about Martin the Warrior. They place it in the Great Hall by Martin's tapestry. The next morning, the stoats are fooling with arrows in the hall and accidentally kill a brother. They flee but before escaping, spy the sword, which they take to present to Farago. Samkin and Arula, the mole maid, go in pursuit, only to find one one dead along the way. They encounter a hermit, Fergal, who tells them it is dry ditch fever. They press on while Fergal goes to warn the abbey, but it was too late. The sickness is spreading throughout the abbey, Legend has it that only the flowers of Ice Tor in the North Mountains can cure the sickness. So Thrug, the otter, accompanied by Dumble, the Dormouse, set off to find the flowers, braving an attack of crows, only to find the flowers guarded by a majestic golden eagle, King McPherson. Meanwhile, Mara and Pickle escape, and through a series of adventures, join with an army of shrews, Samkin and Harula eventually join another group of shrews and recapture the sword. Their group faces a lake serpent, Deep Coiler, and shrews, or sorry, and fearsome white badger who holds a stone sacred to the shrews. 
eventually all go to relieve the besieged forces of Salamandastron. Well, will they make it in time and defeat such a wily foe? And will Samkin and Arula find anyone alive should they make it back to the Abbey? So, as far as Salamandastron, Salamandastron goes, I would give Salamandastron B. I thought it was great. I didn't think it was terribly fantastic. I liked the story about like the long lost brothers, uh, Earth Stripe and Earth White. Earth White is the badger that is holding the sacred stone on the island, is coveted by the Guisum Shoes. So, again, I thought that was cool. The series of unfortunate events, the whole dry ditch fever, it just kind of felt like there was a lot going on, um, which kind of is the reason why I gave it a great tier instead of, like, fantastic. Did that ring any bells for you, sir? No, I really don't remember anything from that one. <laughs> Ah, funny. Cool. Well, next one then is Martin the Warrior. On the marginal or the marinal coast of the Eastern Sea, a cold stone fortress named Marshank rises. Here, a cold, a cruel stoat named Badrang enslaves innocent creatures, using them to build his tyrannical empire. Among these captives resides a particularly courageous mouse named Martin. Gifted with the heart of a warrior, Martin covets freedom. His desire to liberate not just himself, but all of Badrang's victims fuels his courage. Captured as a child, Martin lost the sword of his father, Luke the Warrior, a symbol of hope that Badrang now carries. Despite his grim circumstances, Martin remains unbroken. His bravery and determination ignite a spark of rebellion among the prisoners as he leads them towards liberation. Martin also yearns to reclaim his father's stolen sword. Throughout the narrative, themes of vengeance and liberation entwine. Martin's quest expands beyond physical chains, focusing on a deeper struggle against injustice and cruelty. As far as Martin the Warrior goes, I give it a A tier. I thought this book was fantastic. I just, I felt, I just felt like I like I was Martin the Warrior in this book, and towards the end there is definitely some sadness. Um, and I think this was like the the only Redwall book that I cried at. So you would think that this would be a favorite, but it's not. For just I don't I don't even know. <laughs> it should be a favorite, but it's not. All right, but it is. It is what it is. Sure. I don't remember anything from Martin the Warrior. A lot of these I really don't. Even even with the summaries oh, you're giving well. me, oh, there's there's not much traction for me. No, I mean that's fair. You should definitely read them. I mean, they're quick. I think some of the long. I think one of the longest ones is like four hundred something, but the, most of them range like like two eighty to like three fifty ish pages. So they go pretty quick if you just kind of keep going at it so right but book seven here the bell maker joseph the bell maker is worried because he has not heard from his daughter morel Mar marielle in four seasons marielle is a restless bold little mouse who needs to be off and doing and doing things and she left redwall with her best friend dandon for company then one night Joseph is visited by Martin the warrior in his dreams. From Martin's words, Joseph understands that Marielle is in trouble and needs his help. In short order, Joseph is off with his four uh, with four others: Formal, Rosie Wood Sorrel, the Hare, Hare, and Roof Brush the Squirrel, Dury Quill the Hedgehog. Marielle is indeed in trouble. She and Dandon have gone to the aid of a group of creatures who are trying to overthrow the cruel and heartless fox Ergen Nagru with his bloodthirsty mate Silvermord and their rat hordes. Ergen has taken over Castle Flore and has imprisoned his former owners Gale, Squirrel King, and Queen Serena. Outside the walls of the castle, the good creatures of Southsward scheme and plan trying to find ways to free the prisoners and remove the foxes and their rat soldiers. Slowly but surely, the creatures from Redwall and those of Southsward 
come together to form a force, brave and true, which might have a chance at defeating the terrible Ergen Naguru. So <clears throat> what's really cool, actually, is Ergen Naguru is just each other backwards. So Naguru is Ergen backwards. And Ergen is Nagru forwards. So I thought that was kind of clever. I don't know how many people actually like like caught on to that. But as far as its ranking, I would rank the Bellmaker B tier. I thought it was great um, as far as story goes. A little bit above average. Uh, not quite to the caliber of like Moss Flower and Mariel and uh, Martin the Warrior, but I thought it was definitely a good sequel to Mariel of Redwall. Yeah, again, so far I think I I can agree with your rankings. Again, maybe I'd have Redwall B tier, but it's just me. Yeah, no, fair enough. <clears throat> All right. So, book number eight here, Outcasts of Redwall. So maybe maybe this will jog your memory a little bit. I remember uh, the tale revolves. Or- sorry, go ahead. I'll shut up. Sorry, no, I'm not. I can't see you. So, oh, I was just I'm multitasking remember, between screens. I remember a ferret. Yeah, and he's kind of a brat. Yes, that's yes. about it. And he does. I remember he does something. <laughs> he does something nasty. I can't. I don't remember exactly what it was, but I think he did something pretty bad. So. Uh, The tale revolves around an ill-fated ferret named Veal, raised amongst the humble and kind-hearted beasts of Redwall. The folk of Redwall, known for their love and peace and feasting, endeavor to quell the fires of mischief and savagery that burn within young Veal's heart. Byrony, a a valiant mouse maid finds herself inexorably drawn to protect the wayward creature, though the Abbey brethren remain wary. Meanwhile, darkness is gathering beyond the woods. Swart, Sixclaw, a vile ferret warlord with a lust for power, swears vengeance upon Sunflash the mace, a valorous badger with the spirit of a warrior. Sunflash, along with his indomitable kestrel companion, Scarlath, undertakes a journey of self-discovery, navigating the path between wrath and honor. As the seasons turn, the thread of fate entangle Veal, Byrony, Sunflash, and Swart in a tapestry woven with valor, betrayal, and the eternal struggle between light and darkness. Will Veal find redemption, or shall his nature seal his doom? The halls of Redwall echo with songs of heroes past, as new legends are carved into the annals of Mossflower history, as the storm of battle looms, Veal Six Claw's treachery reaches its apex. But when his poison dart intended for another strikes down Byrony, his heart rends with anguish. It is the love of this brave mouse maid that pierces the shroud of his dark nature. With his final breaths, ve- breaths Veal saves her demonstrating the redemptive power of compassion. Simultaneously, the mighty Sunflash clashes with Swart Sixclaw, his ancient nemesis. A titanic battle between good and evil, the valor of the Badger Lord proves indomitable. Swart and his vanquished and Sunflash's destiny leads him to Salamandistron, where he's crowned Lord. His legacy becomes a beacon of courage, illuminating the annals of Redwall history. So you're probably not going to agree with this one at all, but I would actually give Outcast of Redwall D care D tier. I thought it was bad. It just was all over the place. It didn't really make sense. Uh, you know, he's bad, then he's good, then he's bad, and then he's good, and then he's bad, and then finally at the last end, he's like dies good i I don't know it was just it didn't it didn't flow very well for me i was i was not a fan i struggled with outcasts of red wall quite again just uh i mean it's i'm pretty sure this was the first one that i read so i mean it just kind of has that fond memory of being like oh like this is the first one that i read so i would yeah i don't know that i would have it in s tier but i think i would probably have it in a tier if i reread it 
Maybe I wouldn't feel that way. Hard. It's it's really hard to say. Maybe. But yeah, these- it 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 was. It just yeah, it just felt all over the place. Nothing felt coordinated. It just it very it felt very piecemeal. Gotcha. But uh, that's all I got to say about Zat. All right, book number nine, Pearls of Lutra. Nestled in the heart of Mossflower Woods, the peaceful Redwall Abbey turns into a hub of mystery and suspense with six precious pearls. The Pearls of Lutra are stolen. Our tale sees Martin the Warrior's tapestry disappearing, only to reappear, marked with cryptic hints leading to the stolen pearls. Concurrently, Tansy, a young and fearless hedgehog maid, takes center stage as she deciphers these cryptic clues, demonstrating her wisdom beyond gears. The story sails to the tropical island of San Petra, where the ferocious Emperor Ublaz, also known as Mad Eyes, reigns. His greed for the Pearls of Lutra sets the stage for a confrontation as fierce as the high seas themselves. A parallel plot tracks the journey of the brave Otter Clan, the Holt of Lutra, seeking vengeance for their slain kin, lured to their doom by the Pearl's allure. Their daring voyage crosses paths with the quest of a bold squirrel, Triscar Swarmaid. No, that's not right. Stupid thing. Adding further depth to their elaborate saga... In a tumultuous climax, bravery, wisdom, and unity triumph over greed and vengeance. Tansy, with her intelligence, uncovers the hiding places of the Pearls of Lutra, outwitting numerous treat threats and dangers in her path. Simultaneously, the Holt of Lutra, Otters, and uh, the Holt of uh, Lutra, Otters, and Redwall Resolute Group. F- Storm Sampentra, leading to a confrontation with the malevolent Mad Eyes. In a heart stopping battle, Mad Eyes meets his demise, not by the swords of the otters, but by the venomous bite of his own pet coral snake, triggered by the machination of Grath Longfletch, an otter of Holt of Lutra. With Mad Eyes' end, the pearls are returned to Redwall Abbey, honoring the memory of those who suffered due to their cursed allure. Thus, the saga of the Pearls of Lutra concludes with a poignant reminder of the true price of greed and the indomitable strength of courage and unity. So, Pearls of Lutra, I really liked it. I thought it was really cool how each of these like six pearls... Uh, were hidden throughout the uh, book, um, and it was it was almost kind of like a a little bit of a mystery book with the uncovering of these pearls. But you just feel so bad for Grath Longfletch, whose kin were essentially slaughtered. So she is on the path to vengeance, and it was just cool to see her journey. Um, Pearls of Lutra, I would give a B tier. Definitely great, not really fantastic, uh, like Martin the Warrior or those other in those tier, but definitely above above average. I don't remember much from that one, but it is one of the best book covers in the series, I think. Um, it's either one or two for me. I'm not sure, but I think it's it's one of the best covers, I think. I, I like the art. I love the art. For sure. Yes. All right. All right. Wow. Getting close. So book 10, The Long Patrol. Crisis befalls Redwall Abbey, our gargantuan horde of ruthless rapscallion rats under the brutish command of the unsparring Damug Warfang marches towards Redwall, heralding a conflict that can turn the peaceful land into a crucible of war. Young Hare Tamo's dreams of joining the legendary Long Patrol. The stalwart band of hares from Salamandra, Salamandra Strand Mountain meet fruition when he's whisked into a whirlwind of perilous adventures. Over yonder, Craiga Rose Eyes, a badger lord of Salamandra Strand, foresees ominous tidings through her visions, compelling her to dispatch the Long Patrol to intercept the looming rapscallion threat. 
As the war drums thunder, Redwall's Denzians prepare for the storm, fortifying their defenses and honing their skills. The novel crescendos with the spine-tingling struggle between the forces of good and evil, each battling for the soul of Mossflower. The Long Patrol's valor, Redwall's unity, and the intrigue of unexpected alliances form the backbone of this remarkable tale, promising a riveting saga that sends the heart pounding, reminding us that courage can flourish even in the face of overwhelming adversity. The climax of the Long Patrol holds nothing back in its breathtaking spectacle. The final battle is waged with grim determination as the Red Wallers, aided by the Long Patrol and their newfound allies from the Bird Kingdom, mount a resolute defense against the Rapscallion Horde. The terrible conflict comes to a head in a brutal duel, where Daemug Warfang meets his end by the hands of an unlikely hero, perilously young hair Midge, many coats. The tale ends in triumph and heartache, as Redwall Abbey stands tall amidst the battle's grim's toll, offering a poignant testament of courage, sacrifice, and unity. It's funny because when I was reading this series before, when I was a middle schooler, I remembered hating the Long Patrol. It's interesting. Absolutely hated it. Yeah. But there's this part where you remember in Mossflower how I was talking about uh, the Castle Cotier, where Queen Sarmina ruled. Well, they essentially made Redwall from the remains of Cotier, right? But there's a part in the Long Patrol where they dis- where like one of the walls in Redwall is like sinking. And so they uncover that there's some loose earth or some type of like mud hole or something like, I don't quite remember the specifics and they trek through the remains of Kotir, which I thought was really cool to kind of bring that back into kind of play as far as like the world building part of it. So, and this is where I thought it was funny, but like after I read it, (laughs) I remember going into this one, saying that I wasn't going to enjoy it, but I read it and I was just like, Oh my God, this is great. So I actually, it's one of my favorites. It's one of my favorites. I I would have, I I would have fought for that. Uh, You liked it. Do you remember that one? From what I remember, I think that one, that one would probably be my favorite one that I can remember. That's also the one. I think this and Pearls of Lutra, you could probably flip a coin and either one of them would be my favorite book cover out of the series. But I think, from what I remember, Matt, that book was, like, the battles were pretty epically big and they were pretty brutal, I feel like. Um, and I can yep. kind of remember being like, holy crap, like, and, and I don't really feel like you got that in the previous books as much. Um, no. Um, but I just, I love the cover and I, yeah, I really... That one sticks out as one that I remember really liking. Sweet. Yeah, it uh, it was good. It's definitely, I think it's the only book. Yeah, it is. Now that I'm thinking about it, it's the only one where they have like a large scale battle like you would see in Malazan. It was pretty cool. It was pretty cool to read that. All right. Moving on. Marl Fox, book 11 here. With... All the wit and wonder of a fireside story, this tale echoes with enchantment, peril, and bravery. The ominous marl foxes, possessing eyes of hypnotic ice blue, are the bane of moss flower, but their true terror resides in their ability to become near invisible. A trickery that casts a sinister pal over wood Paul over moss flower woods. The hallowed redstone of Redwall Abbey, normally a sanctuary of peace, is seized by an air of uncertainty when an enchanted tapestry is stolen. Unraveling the tranquil existence of the valiant residence, Song, a squirrel maid, embarks on a quest to retrieve the tapestry, accompanied by Dan Floor and Raguba, a squirrel warrior, and the perky Dibbon infant animals, 
Dippler, and Burble, they venture into unknown ter- territories riddled with danger and deception. Interwoven are tales of seafaring voyages, vo- voyages by the Hair Queen, or, you know, uh, Badger Queen, Lady Craiga Rose Eyes, which are tales spun with Jake's signature mastery over prose. As the saga draws to a close, each thread in the vast tapestry of this tale finds its end. The moral foxes, with their cunning and invisible trickery, meet their doom at the hands of our indomitable forces, our heroes. Lady Craig of Rose Eyes, despite her aging body, vanquishes Mokan, the last moral fox, in a showdown imbued with power and justice. Our young adventurers, having braved the uncharted, return home to Redwall Abbey. Their quest fulfilled, the stolen stap- tapestry safely in tow. Amidst triumph, cheers, and joyous feasting, Redwall Abbey once again resounds with peace and tranquility. The threat of Marl Fox is extinguished. In the spirit of Redwall, though, adventures never truly end. They simply await the next brave soul, ready to take up the mantle, as the fireside stories continue to be spun. So the hard part about Marl Fox is that I loved the concept of Marl Foxes, but it really just felt like a Redwall reimagining. Like the tapestry in Redwall was taken, the tapestry in Marl Fox was taken. You know, you get a group of adventurers trying to get it back. While in Redwall, he's not really looking to get back the tapestry. He does do that. Um, but yeah, it just, Marl Fox just, uh, so while it was good, it wasn't great, nor was it fantastic. So along with Redwall, I give Marl Fox C tier or just good. I remember about all I remember is that the Marl Foxes could go invisible. That's about it. Right. Or near so that was cool. It really... I remember the beginning of the book uh, kind of starting off with those very, these very dark undertones. And um, even when the Marl Foxes are being deceptive, clearly playing on the like babes, right? Like the small children of red, red wall, you know, it gives me like a very like stranger danger beware type of thing. Which is, you know, very dark, you know, it had that like undertone, but then like something just switched and it it became a lot lighter. It came kind of almost redundant. Like I've read this before, you know, like, so I was a little disappointed. I thought that it was going to kind of go a lot darker than it did. That's why I gave it just, it was good. Like I enjoyed it. But it wasn't great, and it wasn't by all means fantastic. Sure. But it wasn't bad either. It was just average. Fair. Middle of the road. <laughs> totally fair. So Legend of Luke. This is where I stopped when I was a middle schooler. Um, and I remembered liking it when I was younger. But there's essentially this book is broken up into three acts. You join Martin the Warrior Uh, as he and his friends set forth on a quest to unearth the tragic and mysterious past of his father, Luke the Warrior. As they voyage through treacherous waters and dark forest, the band of valiant creatures stumble upon fragments of an ancient manuscript narrating the fabled tale of Luke, his father. So in the second act, uh, Luke the epitome of bravery fiercely combats the nefarious pirate stoat Vilu Daskar, who cruelly slaughters his Luke's clan. And then in the third act, we witness Martin returning to Redwall Abbey, his heart heavier with the sorrowful yet pride filled tale of his forefather. Here, the fabric of the tale blends harmoniously as Redwall's citizens culminate the adventure with a, grandiose feast toasting to the memory of his father luke with exhilarating battles heartwarming camaraderie and the enchanting backdrop of moss flowers dense forest 
and the uncharted high north coast, The Legend of Luke promises to ensnare the reader in its entwined saga. In the climax during Luke's part, the fearless Luke with a heart of fire confronts his arch nemesis, Vilu Daskar, in a breathtaking encounter amidst the roaring waves. Luke seizes the moment and binds himself to the helm of Daskar's ship, the Gore Leech. With resolute valor, he steers the ship into the jagged teeth of the rocks, sacrificing himself to send Daskar and his vile crew to a watery grave. Martin the Warrior, forever inspired by his noble lineage, returns to the Abbey in pledges of honor Luke's memory. The tale concludes with the spirit of Luke guiding Martin as Redwall basks in jubilation and pays homage to the undying spirit of the warrior bloodline. So as far as Legend of the Luke, I give it S tier. It was one of my favorites. I loved the imagery, even this cover. Like It makes so much sense when you look at this cover and you read the story. It was amazing. Absolutely loved it. Like in the beginning, Martin is just sad. He's like, I need to know about my dad. And then he meets up with people on the high North coast that actually knew his father and like fight fought alongside of him. And so they, unco- they basically bring out this manuscript because they had documented literally everything, his entire story. And so it was really cool. The first act is like 75 pages And then everything with Luke the Warrior is like 90% of the book. And then the last part is like when he comes home. So it was was great. I loved it. I don't remember if I finished this one. I think I maybe started to read it. But I think think this was as far as I got. I don't think I read anything past this book. And that's about where I had stopped too because – life being a typical teenager. Yeah. I guess in my mind, I kind of like up until 12 is like the first half of Jake's. And then 22 is like the last half. And I kind of found a very distinct difference between the first half and the second half. They just, it very much felt like it was just the same story, but just different events happening. And they kind of like all surround themselves around the siege of Redwall. Like that seems to be the main premise for a lot of these books afterwards, which got a little old and kind of tough to read at times. There, there are definitely some shining moments, but I think that there is maybe one or two that are higher than a B in these last half. I could be wrong. Well, this is a, for. For the most part, I mean, this is all going to be new to me now, I think. Um, I don't... Yeah. What's next, Lord Brocktree? I, mm, I'm not yep. sure. I don't think... I'm pretty confident I never finished Legend of Loot for one reason or another. But I'm not... Yeah, I don't know. I'm not 100% either way, I guess. No worries. All right. Lord Brocktree, which is book 13... So, we embark on a heroic quest where mighty badgers wield ancient swords... The tranquil and sprawling lands of Mossflower Country are enshrouded in dark clouds of tyranny. Salamandistron, a mighty fortress and home to valiant warrior badgers, is under the iron paw of the vile wildcat Uga Troon and his barbarous blue hordes. The very spirit of Redwall Abbey itself quakes under the weight of impending doom. Enter Lord Brocktree, a noble badger of legend- legendary lineage, with the metal and strength of a hundred beasts, teaming up with the spirited hairmaid Dottie, who wields both wit and blade with equal grace, Brock Tree sets out on an epic adventure to reclaim Salamandistron. Through the dense woods of Moss Flower, the intrepid duo forge alliances with the diverse creatures who make this land their home. The flora and fauna come alive in a symphony of words as Jake weaves a tapestry of tantalizing scents and vivid landscapes. Through Tetris battles, riddles in ancient tongues, and the binding cords of honor and friendship, Lord Brocktree and Dottie face adversity with grit and valor. In a storm of clashing steel and roaring thunder, Lord Brocktree faces Uga Troon in the climactic final battle for Salamandistron. 
As the forces of good rally behind the mighty Badger Lord, the land itself seems to awaken to aid them. Through courage, while in unity, Broctree defeats the tyrant, casting Ugat Troon into the merciless embrace of the sea. The Salamandistron reclaimed the warrior Badger alongside Dottie and their newfound friends, establishes a legacy of peace and prosperity. The once oppressed creatures of Mothflower find solace and strength in the guardianship of the warrior Badger Lord. As the fortress stands tall and vigilant, a beacon of hope for all. So, uh, Lord Brocktree is meant to be uh, similar to Mothflower, like a, a prologue of sorts. Definitely chronologically takes place near the beginning of the series or prior to all of the other events. Um, but I would have to give Lord Brock Tree. I would give it a B tier. I thought it was great. Definitely above average. I didn't think that there was a lot about it that was like super fantastic. Um, I loved Dottie. She wasn't like your typical hair, you know, like not always talking about her stomach and feeding and blah. Yeah. That got kind of old. Yeah. I, I, yeah, I just thought it was a great story. Cool. <laughs> Good. I wish that I could remember more like specific details, but I just, yeah, I just remember them being, I just remember this book being great. I wish I had, had read them all so I could contribute a little bit more at this point. <laughs> Well, maybe we can come back to it after you finish them. Be a little ways down the road. That's fine. Fair enough. Yeah, I mean, I'll take a screenshot of my rank. If you read them, you can rank it, and we can compare and contrast. I mean, we have a video diary here of, of what you're thinking. It'll be out there forever. Yeah, that is true. All right, Tagarung. In the en- so this is book 14. In the enchanting Mossflower Woods, the river moss holds whispers of legends and amongst them, the Tagarung, a creature of unmanned strength and skill. Our tale follows the paw steps of Denya, an otter pup stolen from his kin by the average Juskarath clan, a vermin led by the ruthless ferret Sawney Rath. In a twist of cruel fate, the vermin hail Denya as the Tagarung. Raised amongst claws and treachery, Denya's noble spirit remains uncorrupted. His dauntless heart yearns for the wisdom and warmth of his true brethren. Alongside his towering might, the pages bloom with tales of whimsy and merriment at Redwall Abbey, while valorous beasts conjure feasts and songs to rival the stars. Yet, shadows lurk even in the most re- resplendent places. As Dania searches for his true home, His valor is tested at every turn, and dark forces seem to claim the power of the Tagarung. While the ancient songs of the otters guide him, or will the snarls of his false lineage engulf him? In a crescendo of courage and steel, Dania's soul finds its kindred shore. After facing trials by land and water, his destiny is revealed through ancient otter lore, guiding him to his birthright. At Redwall Abbey, where honeyed laughter sings through the halls, he's renamed Tag as he embraces his heritage. But lo, his nemesis, the ferret Antigra and her son, Zan Juskarath, conspire to claim vengeance for Sani Rath's demise. In a tempest of clashing blades, Tag's unwavering spirit shines as the righteous might of Redwall beasts back the shadowy tide. At the story's close, the abbey's is bequeathed of jo- with joyful songs, sumptuous feasts, and hearts woven within bonds unbreakable. Tag, the Tagarung, becomes the guardian of peace, and his story is etched in the annals of Redwall's illustrious history. I love this book. Really? So, I give it S tier. I It was definitely one of my favorites. It's kind of like the opposite of Outcast of Redwall, but done much better. I don't know if it's just because you don't. I, I think the hard part about Outcast of Redwall is that you just don't have very much empathy for like what you would consider the villains of the story or the bad guys. But 
Tagarung is almost the exact opposite of that. You take somebody from Redwall who gets, you know, his father is killed and then he is, you know, basically captured and indoctrinated into being a bad guy, but in his heart doesn't feel like he should be this way. So, I mean, they're kind of, they're similar stories, but almost the exact opposite. But for whatever reason, I don't know if he just learned from his mistakes in Outcast of Redwall, but the story was just much better. There was a lot more emotion involved. Like you were just really hoping for this mother and his sister that are like, we know he's out there somewhere. He can't be dead. And like, you just hope for that. And it, yeah, it was, it was great. It was great. No comments, sir. No comments. Sorry. I wasn't sure if you could see me or not. All right. <laughs> not at all. <clears throat> not until I like switch back. Gotcha. All right. Well, uh, book 15, Triss, a brave squirrel maid enslaved by the brutal ferret king, King Agar- Agarnu, and his vicious daughter, Princess Kurda, has endured enough of their tyranny at Riftguard Fortress. With her indomitable spirit and heart as strong as Redwall Oak, she flees, joining forces with two fellow captives, Welfo and Shog. <clears throat> Meanwhile, in Moss Flower, an old friend of Redwall Abbey, the hardy hedgehog Sagax, yearns for adventure. He sets sail with his boisterous companion, Biscarum, Lepswold Whipscut, a hare with a pendant for food and trouble. Their paths soon intertwine with Triss and her companions when their ship gets wrecked near Riftguard. Meanwhile, at Redwall Abbey, the sweet Melodus Dibbons find an ancient cryptic riddle. The clues lead to Brock Hall, the ancestral home of badgers, and unravel a secret bound to the enchanted sword of Martin the Warrior. The fates of Riftguard and Redwall are bound together as a tapestry of courage, friendship, and legacy unravels. The sinister Princess Kurda has her cold eyes on the throne, while ancient evils are afoot. Triss, who emerges as a valiant and fearless warrior, brandishes the sword of Martin the Warrior to vanquish her foes. Alongside Shog and Welfo, they free Riftguard from the ruthless grip of King Agarnu and Princess Kurda. Their bonds, strengthened through hardship and battle, become everlasting as they pledge to safeguard the innocent. Sagax and Biscarum, forever altered by their escapade, return to Mossflower. At Redwall, the Dibbons decipher the riddle and unshroud the secret of Brock Hall. Through their efforts, the sword forged by a timeless hero is restored to its rightful home in Redwall Abbey. Triss decides to make Redwall her new home, and the fabled Abbey once again stands as a beacon of hope and valor. So, I absolutely did not like Triss. Oh, I thought oh. it was terrible. It was, it was, it, I did not like it. There's this like part where there's like three snakes like tied together because the, you know, King Agarnu had come over to Moss flower and like had a battle with these snakes and they somehow like grew together. I can't quite remember like the whole, it, it was hard to get through. I didn't connect with Triss. I just, the the her adversaries princess kurdu or whatever you want to call her kurda they did this like weird german accent it was like oh, you know it just it didn't it didn't work it didn't work for me at all didn't work i uh i'm surprised that you have one that is in the f tier i wasn't expecting that Really? Yep. Why weren't you expecting it? I don't know. I just I didn't I didn't think there would be. I mean, yeah, you you ha- you have it there. You have it there. I mean, on the list, but or as an option. But I didn't I didn't think it would get used. So, the majority of these books, I I mean, like I said, are are C and above. But there are a few that I'm like, mm, it just I couldn't connect with it, you know. And maybe. 
Maybe I just wasn't paying close attention or what, but oh well. Now we move on to Loam Hedge, which is book 16. Uh, the tale begins with a peculiar prophecy found within an ancient Appy records, hinting at a cure for the young, wheelchair-bound hairmaid Martha Braybuck. Concurrently, an audacious trio of vermin, Raga Bowl, Flinky, and Bladetail, conceive a despicable plot to pillage Redwall. Our heroes, Brave Hair, a brave hare, Bragoon, and a comical squirrel, Sarbando, are led by the words of ancient rhyme to undertake a daring quest to Loam Hedge, a once thriving haven, now a dilapidated shell of its former glory, in hopes of finding a cure for Martha. <clears throat> Meanwhile, in Redwall, the Abbey dwellers must hold fast against the villainous onslaught. With valor at their hearts and the specter of danger at their heels, Bragoon and Sarbando reach the haunting ruins of Loam Hedge. Yet, the solution they find is not a physical cure, but a revelation. The only limitations are the ones we impose on ourselves. This profound truth emboldens Martha Braybuck to cast aside her inability to walk and rises from a wheelchair, walking of her own will at last. Back in Redwall, the brave Abbey dwellers valiantly defend their home, using strategy and unity to overcome the vermin horde. With an unexpected sacrifice from an unlikely character, they foil Ragabol's insidious plans. The, the tale concludes with a victorious feast in Redwall Abbey, the air rich with celebration and stories of bravery and fortitude. So, very similar to Triss, like, it wasn't as bad, but it was bad. It was not terrible, but it was bad. This whole concept, like, you travel all this way to Loam Hedge, which is where they visited in Matameo. So, like, when I was looking at the cover of this book, I'm like, oh, my God, we get to go back to this place, which I thought was so cool in Matameo, one of my favorite books of the series, I thought we were going to get to expand a little bit more on the lore, like the world history kind of seeing like maybe what happened after the battle at the end of Matameo. But no, these two warriors go out to fetch a cure that doesn't even exist, but was still written down. But why not? Right. Why, why it was buried with her. I, I don't know. It just, it didn't make any sense. <laughs> it, I'm not a fan. Honestly, just talking about it right now kind of makes me want to put it in F tier. <laughs> oh, <laughs> wow. Uh, I was going to ask you if you didn't mention it, but I thought Loam Henge was brought up in one of the earlier books, but I wasn't sure, and I definitely wouldn't have remembered which one it was. Yeah, it was it was Matameo. Loam Hedge is where it's like the original. It's the original. It's the original Redwall Abbey. Creatures from Loam Hedge essentially left because of a sickness, came into Mossflower Woods, founded Brock Hall, and then eventually built Redwall gotcha. with Martin the Warrior. Gotcha. Almost there. So Rackety Tam, book 17. Uh, fearless and valiant, Rackety Tam McBurl, a gallant squirrel warrior with a Scottish brogue, doffs his bonnet to fate, as he and his trusty comrade, Wild Doogie Plume, heed the call of destiny. Their path crosses the imperiled squirrel maid, Artulum, whose kin have been felled by the nefarious Gulu the Savage, a vile wolverine with an insatiable appetite for conquest and destruction. Armed with only their wits, swords, and undying spirit, the heroic duo pledge to protect the innocent and seek vengeance. Meanwhile, at the serene Redwall Abbey, the tranquil creatures face a riddle left by the ancient warrior Brock Tree. Sister Armel, a healer with a wisdom as deep as the oceans, takes it upon herself to unravel the riddle with the guidance of the Abbey's fabled tapestry. As our heroes venture through the foreboding forests and across temptuous rivers, battling fierce foes and foraging alliances with other noble beasts, the tapestries of their tales are woven together in an enthralling dance of valor, wit, and camaraderie. 
In a thunderous crescendo of blades and hearts, Rackety Tam and Wild, Wild Doogie Plume face Gulu the Savage in a fi- final cataclysmic battle with Valor coursing through their veins. The duo vanquishes the despicable Gulu. However, Wild, Wild Doogie is tragically slain. Rackety Tam, wreathed in glory and sorrow, is named the champion of Redwall. His heroic heart finds solace as he dons the ancient armor, discovered through Sister Armel's deciphering a Brock Tree's riddle. Rackety Tam uh, takes up residence at Redwall, protecting the Abbey and raising Ar- 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 Araltum as his adopted daughter with an undying memory of his falling, fallen brother in arms. So I really liked this one. The hard part was, is that like they, again, he writes with like these characters having like a very thick Scottish accent. And I have no idea what any of those words mean. So it was like really hard, but outside of that, I would give it, it was great. I loved the story. I loved the villain. He was brutal. Uh, There was a lot of like sneaking going around, um, but again, you know, all centric around a siege of Redwall. <laughs> so it, uh, again, familiar story, familiar like base plot, but with just different characters and uh, like different events and, and like side stories. They're just kind of a standard formula Redwall, siege, stuff happens, resolved. Pretty much, yeah. <clears throat> especially after like 12 it seems to kind of be uh, you know the base formula the first 12 like seem to take take characters away from redwall whereas like the last half kind of bring villains to redwall gotcha is i guess kind of the way that i can really deduce that the best all right high rulain which is book 18 so, uh, venture forth to the tranquil shores of Redwall Abbey, where young creatures grow amidst riddles and feasts. Our spirited heroine, Taria Wildlow, is an otter maid of Green Isle, yearning for the open waves and swashbuckling adventures. But her heart is restless, for an ancient song whispers secrets <clears throat> and kindles an unquenchable fire in her spirit. One fateful night, the spirit of High Queen Rulane visits Taria in a dream, and the cryptic echoes of old unravel the tapestry of destiny. Taria, guided by an age-old prophecy, embarks on a journey across the seas, emboldened by her yearning to protect her kin from the ironclad paw of tyranny. Alongside her trusty comrades, her sail to Green Isle, a land oppressed by a wildcat warlord, Rigu Fellis, and his dastardly minions entered the wondrous world of soaring cliffs, wild seas and a courage undying as Taria dons the mantle of the warrior and honed her skills. She is to become the high queen Rulane, liberator of her kin and guardian of green Isle alongside the brave skipper and riddling Britain T her path is fraught with challenges from daring sea battles to cryptic riddles of ancient Mm -hmm. lore. Beware that, and for herein lies the culmination of a legend. The high tides of destiny sweep Taria to the heart of the battle in Green Isle. Through valor, wisdom, and the strength of comradeship, she vanquishes Rugufelis, the tyrant wildcat, and frees her brethren from his vile clutches. Atop the ancient halls where wind whispered tales of old, Taria Wildlow is crowned High Queen Rulane guardian and liberator of her kin peace and freedom bloom like golden dawn over green isle meanwhile though back at redwall the bard sings song of the brave otter maid whose spirit roars as the sea and whose heart is steadfast as the ancient rocks the echoes of the high rulane resound through ages yet unborn i remember this book as it's you know these later ones are ones that i most recently finished and it was it was good. I mean, there were definitely some high parts, some really interesting parts. Uh, the original queen, uh, essentially her ship sank outside on the seas outside of Salamandastron. And the badger lord there uh, pretty much told her that 
the original queen's armor is in a ship underneath the sea there. So like she goes and gets it because she's an otter. Yeah, there was, there was some high points, but there was just some like parts of the story that I'm like, ah, I've, I've heard this already. You know, I loved the, I guess vehemence of the otters of the green isle that are standing up to these like tyrannical wildcats. So I actually give high Lane. Oh no, I didn't give it a B. I gave it a C. So it was, yeah, it was good, but it just, it wasn't great and it wasn't fantastic, but by all means, it wasn't bad either. Really. This should be like a, a B and a half. Like, it should be between C and B tier. Like a B minus. So, yeah. I mean, it was a little bit better than average, but it wasn't quite great. Fair. So it was good. Eulalia, book 19. So the story takes place in the enchanting realms of Redwall Abbey, and the storm-lashed, treacherous high north coast. Our hero, Gorath the Flame, is the last of his line battling against insurmountable odds to reclaim his birthright and avenge his kin. Beset by the nefarious sea raider, Visca Longtooth, and his verminous crew. In the walls of Redwall Abbey, young buffful stag Madger, an unwitting foreseer of destiny, is lured by the call of adventure and an ancient sword waiting to sing. In this tale of valor, and kinship, the Abbey Dwellers and Garath's path cross as an ancient fid- riddle and clashing steel set them upon a quest to thwart evil's designs. Oh, at the climactic battle, the brave badger Gorath the Flame, armed with fabled uh, Martin Warrior's ancient sword and guided by the wisdom of the... Through blood and tears, Gorath valiantly avenges his kin as Longtooth's dark ambition meets a fiery end. With victory hard won, Gorath, with a heart ablaze, decides not to wield a sword again, finding peace and purpose with Redwall Abbey. Meanwhile, visions foretell a future that stretches far beyond the pages. Ballads continue to thrive. Eulalia thus bids us goodbye leaving the echoes of clashing steel and joyous hearts resounding through the ancient woods and rolling waves. I uh, probably should have read that summary better. Um, I it just, Eulalia was, it started off really good. Like go wrath of flame has a very like tragic backstory and where he ends up. He's basically like a prisoner on Visca Longstooth's ship. He's just defeated. He's depressed, but then somehow he is freed and they make their way to Redwall and Visca is trying to conquer Redwall. And yeah, it was, it was, there were some good moments, but it wasn't, it wasn't like elaborate or it just, it kind of fell off from where I wanted it to go. But sure. I guess that is what it is sometimes. There. All right. Doomite. Uh, Gonf, the Prince of Mouse Thieves, has left behind a trove of treasure hidden deep in the earth. Red-eyed whites, eerie specters of the dark forest, led by the cunning Corvus Skur, seek these glittering jewels for their sinister powers. This sets our heroes upon a daring quest to decipher ancient riddles, delve into forgotten histories, and forestall the doom that the whites seek to unleash upon the innocent citizens of Mossflower. The landscape, both enchanting and perilous, plays its part as an ancient character. The rivers, the forests, and uh, stone come alive in a tale that ensnares the reader in its web of wonder and courage. As the legends unfold, the air thick with valor, the final confrontation between Corvus Skur, Doom Whites, and the heroic warriors of Redwall blazes through the shadowy forest. The tale of Mossflower's ancient history unravels with every heart pounding uh, heartbeat, and as the hidden treasure of Gaunt the Mouse, Mouse Thief reveals itself to be four dazzling colored stones, each with the history entwined. In a myth and mystery. 
A clash of forces sees the dastardly Corvus Skur slain by a noble owl. Bliss is a an ascendant from the original snake Asmodeus and is also eliminated and killed. And in a heartwarming reunion with the past, the ghosts of Gonth and his beloved Columbine assist in the recovery of the jewels. The jewels are restored to the eyes of the Doomite idol, thus sealing away the evil that sought to lay waste to the moss flower. The spirit of unity, courage, and sacrifice triumphs over the shadowed turmoil as songs of your echo through the woods once more. These summaries are not good. Um, okay, internet, do better. Internet, do better. But Doomite, one of my favorites. It was dark. I loved how they brought up a descendant from Asmodeus, which is the original snake in Redwall. So I really liked how they brought in like little little Easter eggs, so to speak, from previous books. Um, Gaunt the Mouse Thief, which appeared in Moss Flower, has hidden these things from an idol that is like buried deep in some type of gaseous poison chamber. Um, yeah, it, yeah, it was good. It, it, you know, a little bit of a different villain. It was predicated around birds and reptiles kind of working together, which they don't end up working together. They kind of, you know, fight amongst each other, so to speak, and end up getting themselves killed. But, yeah, I just I loved I loved this book. It was definitely kind of the dark that I was looking for in Marl Fox. And it kind of like it kept that throughout the whole the whole thing. Cool. If there's anything, Derek, like read Tagarung and Doom White. Like those are probably the only two out of the later half that you like should read. I I'll save this for the end because I I've, I've got a couple things that I, I'm gonna ask you at the end. Uh, like basically one. All thing. right, all right. Well, we got two left, so these summaries I'm finding are disastrous. So I apologize, y'all. <laughs> um, don't listen to the summaries. Listen to my reviews and ratings. <laughs> so Redwall Abbey is once again besieged by the cunning and malevolent forces of villainy. A nefarious warlord, Vileya the Sable Queen, conjures a sinister plot to undermine the peace and prosperity of the kind-hearted creatures dwelling within the walls of Redwall. She commands an army of ravenous, ruthless vermin ready to bend the forest to their will. With seasoned warriors away on a quest, it's up to the Abbey's valiant youngsters to thwart the wicked queen. Buckler the Hare, a gallant, swashbuckling swords beast, is pulled from his comfortable life as a kitchen assistant into the whirlwind of adventure. Alongside him is the fierce warrior Axel Sternclaw, who is determined to prove his mettle in the perilous es escapades ahead. They are aided by the cryptic riddles of Sister Alchemy, whose prophetic verses guide them through a dark woods and treacherous caverns. Villagea, the Sable Queen, meets her demise in the most poetic of fashions as the forces of Redwall and the Woodlanders converge upon the fortress of the queen a tumultuous battle ensues buckler the hare the gallant kitchen warrior engages the evil queen in combat through bravery and teamwork the red walls rescue the kidnapped babes the final act of vilea is as treacherous is a treacherous blow against buckler but her malevolence ultimately consumes her as she falls victims to her own poison blade so i really like sable queen and i actually kind of like debated do i put this in a tier or do i put it in b tier but it just it it doesn't it's not quite fantastic like it's great but it wasn't like the fantastic that i loved with moss flower and marielle and martin the warrior but the sable queen is just she's sinister and she ends up kidnapping a bunch of like woodland creatures children to like force them into giving up their homes in trade but she's got this like second in command who's got other ideas he would rather just take these things by force 
And um, the second in command ends up killing Buckler the Hare's like brother, who was like a uh, who left Salamandastron to just like live a gentle life out in like the farmlands. And he ends up the second in command from Vilea ends up killing Buckler's brother. So you know all of that tension. Just it was really cool to see. It was heart wrenching, um, and I almost kind of felt like the Sable Queen could have kept like there could have been a second book about it. It just seemed like it ended really abruptly, hmm. but I liked it. It was good, very enjoyable. All right, last book here: The Rogue Crew. So, uh, as waves crash against the rugged coastline, this tale uh, unfolds. An enchanting realm of moss flower. The tale roars to life as the sinister sea rats, led by the fearsome Razid we- Were Rat, scheme to conquer moss flower aboard their dread vessel, the Green Shroud. These marauders leave not but devastation in their wake. But fear not, for hope blooms. When an innocent hedgehog family is ensnared in Razid's merciless machinations, the Dauntless Squirrel Score Axe Count emerges as an unexpected hero, leading a motley crew of swashbuckling otters known as the Rogue Crew. As the war drums reverberate across Moss Flower, the residents of Redwall Abbey find themselves entwined in the struggle. Abbot Thib, guardian of the Abbey's wisdom and lore, is plagued by cryptic riddles and visions signifying an impending doom. As the storm clouds gather, the rogue crew races against time, forging alliances with woodland creatures and ancient warriors. Unbeknownst to them, the valiant young squirrel, Posey, a red wall, holds the key to a secret that could spell the were-rat's ruin. With the battle cries and clashing steel, blood and valor, the rogue crew sets a course through treacherous waters and dense forests. The rousing tale beckons to the brave of heart wrapped in epic battles, undying friendships and ancient prophecies and a final confrontation that will decide the fate of moss flower in a clash worthy of legends. The brave rogue crew faces Razid where rat in a Titanic battle upon the roaring. Wow. In a Titanic battle at the gates of red wall, the ancient guardian of moss flower, the vengeful spirit of Lone hedge badger lady Razid the where rat is taken out. And with the wisdom bestowed by Abbot Thib's cryptic riddles, Young Posey plays her part, revealing Razid's weakness. In a final desperate gamble, Razid attempts to demolish Redwall Abbey, but is thwarted by the unity of Moss Flower's woodland cur- characters. Creatures! Man, I really should have just... I should have just summarized these books. That was atrocious. But I think it did its, it, it did what it needed to do. So where do you rate this one? Uh, but... For the Rogue Crew, I give it a B. I thought it was great. The The ship that they're on uh, is essentially built uh, with wheels, so it can float and kind of come on land. Huh, interesting. So it was really cool. But again, same type of premise. Uh, they hear, these villains hear about Redwall and somehow think that it's, you know, full of treasures and things that these peaceful creatures don't really care about. Um, so yeah, it was a good story. I thought it was a nice way to kind of end the series. I know that in the last book, I almost kind of procrastinated it a bit because I just, I didn't want it to be over. Uh, but alas, I'm done. I have finished the red wall series. This is how I would rank them personally. Granted, Y'all don't have to agree with me. That's totally cool. But these are kind of where I sit. I would definitely find myself rereading seeing above. <laughs> so all but three of them. Um, I would be curious what what people think of your rankings, if they agree or disagree. Um, and so if I was going to pick just two that I haven't read, you think I should, it would be Tagarung and... Uh, Doom White. Doom White, yep. I would probably add Triss in there as well, just to see if I think it's as bad as you think it is. 
are these so i guess the last thing that i would have you have the like basically i would want to keep rapid fire here can you rank them basically your most favorite and obviously tris is your least favorite but each tier can you would you rapid fire put them in order how you think you prefer them oh like my favorites yeah 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 it's just, so just like you have like a cohesive list of your most favorite you know second favorite so forth all the way down uh so s tier my yeah so first one would be metameo doom white long patrol tagarung and then legends of luke a tier, I would go Moss Flower, Martin the Warrior, Mariel. B tier, so I would go Rackety <laughs> Tam, probably Road Crew, the Bellmaker. Well, actually, Bellmaker. No, oh, whoops. Rackety Tam, Salamanistron, the Pearls of Lutra. So, yeah, probably that. C tier, I'd like to outcast better than Lone Hedge, and Triss is just by itself so yeah i would say that these are probably what i would place as like my highest in each tier so if you were to rank them one through 22 madame mayo would be number one doom white two so forth correct yep yeah i don't know i I guess that yeah that was that was good i didn't think of that i don't think i've got any other questions yeah super fun uh i'm glad that we got to I guess practice before this weekend, especially using kind of our new, our new platform. Right, we'll have to see what happens uh, when I get around to editing it. But yeah, it was super fun to get back into it again. Please, if you're watching this, don't watch it for the Redwall summaries. Just listen to them to kind of maybe revive <laughs> what you remember even though those summaries were garbage um maybe before you just pause the video <laughs> before i get to the ranking and just kind of reacquaint yourself with the book that i'm talking about um and then listen to my ranking but this is how we this is how we format the show we summarize stuff so yes. It was fun. Uh, a lot of a lot of memories here, and obviously stuff that I haven't read yet. But uh, yeah, I should I should definitely work on picking these books up. Yeah, I think I would like to venture into getting all the hardbacks instead of the paperbacks. But they're so discombobulated as far as like having any type of matching to them. Sure. So I'm I'm good. Yeah. Yeah. Well, cool. Thanks for joining alongside while I did this. Uh, Absolutely, man. For sure. Cool. Well, (laughs) I'm going to go hang out for a little bit. Maybe eat some dinner. Um, I will probably do the same and maybe, maybe try to read a little bit here. And I was like, we're recording this five days before we do our live stream. So this will come out after that at some point. So uh, that's about the timeline that we're at right now wherever this comes out. So yeah, we haven't recorded anything and probably the better part of a month or over a month. So it's it, good to get back into it a little bit here. Yeah, for sure. All right, ma'am. Yeah. Well, have a good night. Yeah. Take her easy, dude. See you, ma'am. Bye. Bye. Okay.
CNJ's at Big Quest. CNJ's at Big Quest. CNJ's at Big Quest. CNJ's at Big Quest.